Negative option billing is a payment structure which requires that customers decline to receive a good or service before a bill arrives in order to not be charged for that good or service. To not be charged for something they didn't necessarily want and definitely didn't ask for. Probably the best known example of a business predicated on this charging method in the United States was Columbia House which started its life as a music mail-order service that promised customers a free record, and later, free 8-tracks, cassettes, CDs, and ultimately, VHS tapes and DVDs, when they expanded their offerings to include films, rather than just music. You'd sign up to get a free something, and sometimes multiple free somethings, but then as part of that sign-up process, you'd be auto-opted in to a so-called club, which was the terminology they used for a membership program that committed you to paying full price, plus shipping, for a certain number of CDs, DVDs, or whatever else within a certain time frame. And if you didn't buy that many CDs or VHS tapes within that predefined time frame, you would be auto-charged for the amount you would have spent on such products as a lump sum at the end of that period. Variations of this model were used throughout the lifespan of this company, one of which committed the customer to buying a certain number of products at full price over a certain period of time, the next few years, for instance, but then would periodically send out notices about a special discount offer to those who have knowingly or unknowingly signed on to this agreement, again, usually because they were given something cheap or free up front, and because the cost of those free things weren't entirely clear when they opted in. So they would sign on to this agreement, receive a notice of a discount offer, and if these folks didn't respond to that notice, informing them of that discounted offer, they would be sent the discounted product, but charged full price for it. And often the wording on these notices was unclear enough that even folks who tried hard to understand the terms didn't really get what they were committing to, or what not responding would entail. It seemed like a coupon, but it was a coupon you had to reply to positively to get a discounted rate on that product. You had to respond to negatively to not receive the product at all, and if you didn't do one of those two things, you were automatically billed for that product at full price. Not responding obligated you to purchase something that they selected at a price that you were not provided. Different pieces of Columbia House were eventually gobbled up by a smattering of other companies, but at its peak in 1994, the music club component of this business model accounted for over 15% of all CD sales, and in 1996, they had 16 million people signed up for the music club alone, each of them paying out the full face price of CDs at a regular cadence. Though it's one of the better-known utilizers of this business model, Columbia House is far from the only company to have used it. Many modern monthly services, like those that send boxes of things to members on a regular basis, utilize a similar strategy, offering up something for free and then auto-committing folks who ask to receive that free thing to another box the following month, typically charged full price. And in some cases, folks are opted in to receive that next shipment in a way that's either unclear or difficult to cancel or both. Thankfully, the full-on negative option billing tactic of using sneaky language, very small legal text, and sending bills early isn't as common today due to heftier laws related to what's sometimes called inertia selling being passed in places like Canada and the United Kingdom, and because of some well-publicized lawsuits in the United States against companies using such approaches, like the one launched against scholastic book clubs by parents who found themselves locked into such a model via methods that they felt were deceitful and intentionally intimidating in the early 2000s. One digital innovation that made such business models less necessary for companies that wanted to lock customers in to a contract 
that seemed good up front, but wasn't necessarily what they wanted longer term, was the introduction of the contractual checkbox, often referred to as a EULA for End User License Agreement when used in software. These checkboxes say, in essence, I'm checking this box because I've read all the legal copy associated with it, and I agree with what that legal copy says. In practice, this is almost never the case. The legal copy in question can be thousands of words, and in some cases hundreds of pages long. But for the purposes of getting people to agree to things, in an often, at least partially, legally defensible way, these checkboxes are gold because they allow the folks who built the software or who are running the website in question to say, hey, they agreed to it. If they want to back out now, the legal copy they said that they read by clicking that checkbox clearly says what they will have to pay to do so. That said, the legality of this sort of claim is not entirely clear. In the United States, for instance, some courts have chosen to enforce them, but others have not, and these legal decisions are partially adjudicated by the wording that's used, partially related to the type of contract, the type of customer, the type of company, or the consequences of that legal text. And in some cases, it seems to be more or less the luck of the draw, how the judge in the case was feeling that day, or the legal precedents set in a particular region related to the specific lawsuit. What I'd like to talk about today are click-based contracts, and one recent example of such a tactic that has garnered quite a few headlines, but which is also, arguably, kind of just a more extravagant and shameless version of a fairly common approach to political fundraising. <laughs> You're listening to Let's Know Things. I'm Colin Wright. Let's Know Things is an independent, listener-supported show. If you're enjoying what you hear, consider leaving a quick review wherever you get your podcasts. Doing so only takes a moment, but they have an outsized effect in helping other people find this show, and that is particularly important for medium-sized independent shows like this one that unfortunately do not have a large marketing budget or the default credibility associated with being part of a large podcast network. A great big thanks to everybody who's already helped support the show in this way or in some other way, monetary or non-monetary. You're the reason I'm able to commit the time that I do to this show each week, and for that, I am truly grateful. All right, let's get back to the show. The article I'd like to start with today comes from The Verge, and it's entitled Trump Used Dark Patterns to Trick Supporters into Donating Millions More Than Intended. This piece takes us back to 2016, when then-presidential candidate Donald Trump became President Donald Trump, but his emails asking supporters for money didn't stop, which isn't entirely unusual. Folks from both Republican and Democratic parties often keep their fundraising emails going after taking office, sometimes to keep their coffers full for their next run, and sometimes so they can provide assistance, often in the shape of advertisements, for other politicians in their party, running for other offices up and down the political power pyramid. These emails continued to flow at an uncommonly rapid pace, though, and the language they used became more and more frantic and pointed by June 2020, four years later, at which point Trump's fundraising levels were clearly falling behind then-Democratic presidential candidate Joe Biden's efforts. By October of 2020, the re-election campaign had started using a fundraising approach, similar in some ways to the one utilized by Columbia Records. If you received Trump's campaign emails, you would see a bright yellow text box with all bold letters, every fourth or so word in caps, and a little blue checkbox next to it. One such text box said the following, quote, This is the final month until election day, and we need every patriot stepping up if we're going to win four more years for President Trump. 
He is revitalizing our economy, restoring law and order, and returning us to American greatness. But he's not done yet. This is your chance. Stand with President Trump and maximize your impact now! Exclamation point. End quote. Now, that checkbox was pre-checked, so it looked like you, the recipient of the email, were agreeing with this statement, which makes sense if you're on the list to receive that kind of fundraising message. But down at the bottom of that box, and it's somewhat easy to miss if you're not looking for it because it's the only text, not in all bold, with no capitalized keywords or all caps, shout words, and no punctuation of any kind, exclamation point or otherwise. Down there at the very bottom, it says, quote, make this a weekly recurring donation until 11-3, end quote. And that 11-3 in that case meant November 3rd. Another similar fundraising message used a similar box with a similar blue check mark and signed people up to automatically donate another $100 on top of what they intended to contribute at a set date in the near future. And the text informing donators about this additional add-on donation was once more in smaller, more subtle text. And below everything else, the check box auto-checked so that people would have to find it understand it, and uncheck the box if they wanted to avoid being charged $100 more than what they committed to giving above. Eventually, a second checkbox was introduced to these emails, one that was apparently, within the campaign, called a money bomb. And this made it so that even if you read and understood and unchecked the box in that first message that would auto-sign you up to keep donating the same amount you entered for weeks into the future, or, as in that second example I mentioned, auto-signed you up to give another $100 on top of what you were already giving, you would still, because of this second checkbox, double your intended donation amount. So if you intended to give $100, you would be charged $200. If you intended to give 1000 you would be charged 2000 And maybe more than that, depending on how many of these checkboxes were included in that particular message, and how many you didn't see or understand or manage to uncheck before clicking the button to send your donation. So in short, what would seem, from casual examination, to be a bright yellow box with big, bold, almost randomly capitalized letters, a highly contrasting blue checkbox pre-checked, which you might reasonably assume is just you agreeing to all of the words, shouty and non-shouty, contained within that box, singing Trump's praises, or maybe something saying that it's fine to donate to the campaign, it's actually a pre-checked box opting in those who donated into some additional donation, including, in some cases, making that same donation several more times, once a week, until some point in the future. For some people, that several more times turned an intended $500 donation into a $3,000 donation, only noticed because the person who made it ran out of money. And this person, who was quoted in a New York Times piece on this story, was a 63-year-old cancer patient living on less than $1,000 a month, whose bank account was emptied by this auto-opt-in donation system, making him think initially that he'd been the victim of fraud. Another donor to Trump's campaign, a 78-year-old California resident who gave $990 via Trump's website in September of 2020, had that same donation recur seven more times, charging him nearly $8,000 in total. The money the campaign was forced to pay back, around $64.3 million from recurring donations made in the final two and a half months of the campaign alone, but around $122.7 million in total over the course of that second re-election campaign was paid out from funds contributed to the campaign by folks making donations intended to help Trump contest the 2020 election results that indicated Joe Biden had won. In other words, emails that went out just before and after the election results came in, showing Biden to be the likely and eventually definitive winner, asked supporters for money to pay for the legal process required to challenge these results. 
Most of those funds, though, collected using that messaging, instead of being used for that purpose, were used to pay back people who felt that they had been scammed by this recurring donation trick earlier in the campaign. On top of this, those who did eventually have their money refunded when they complained, and in some cases when they brought lawsuits against the campaign, were charged processing fees by the for-profit business the campaign used to collect and process these donations, a company called WinRed, which was able to pocket about $5 million from the refund-focused processing fees alone. Ultimately, the Trump campaign had to refund 10.7% of all of the money it raised via WinRed in 2020. And all campaigns have to refund money over the course of an election cycle, sometimes because people try to donate more than is legally allowed, and sometimes for other reasons. But for comparison, the Biden campaign refunded 2.2% of the donations they received, compared to that 107 for the Trump campaign which again totaled $122.7 million over the course of that campaign. It should probably be noted as well that this flood of money in both directions came in the wake of an absolute torrent of emails from the Trump campaign in late 2020, in some cases resulting in 15 emails per day for people who signed up to receive them via the campaign's website many of them using demonstrably misleading or manipulative language, telling recipients that there was a limited-time offer, a club they could join, an opportunity for them to be MVPs or to have Trump be told personally about their individual donation. And in at least one case, the email asked people to keep a checkbox checked to make sure a record amount of money would be donated to the campaign on Trump's birthday. Most of which, I should also note, is not entirely unusual when it comes to campaign fundraising in the United States. The Biden campaign, and pretty much every other Republican or Democratic campaign in modern politics, up and down the ballots, have utilized manipulative, emotionally charged language of some kind in order to rally the troops, get people motivated to support a collection of causes, and get out and vote, and to collect money that can then be used for everything from paying campaign staff, to providing security for the candidates' events, to running ads in relevant markets. The unusual thing, in this case, is just how over-the-top manipulative the language and the design choices were in these campaign materials. And that type of manipulation, which borders on and in some cases potentially stepped over the line into the illegal, and I'll talk more about that in a moment, has been used by other Republican candidates already in 2021, including David Perdue and Kelly Loeffler, two Republican Senate incumbents in Georgia. This extension of that more broadly used approach, then, is spreading in part because of that fundraising transaction processing company, WinRed, which did well financially as a result of all this and which has since offered the same template to other Republican Party candidates, which may mean that we will see a lot more of this kind of thing in the future. One of the determining factors as to how common it ultimately becomes, though, and whether and how it changes shape in the future either becoming more extreme and misleading, or less, is a regulation in the U.S. state of California that was recently updated to strengthen its enforcement, and which now includes a ban on some categories of dark pattern. The term dark pattern was coined in 2010 by a user experience designer named Harry Brignall to refer to, refer to design choices, and especially those related to decisions the user makes, that are manipulative in some way. Some dark patterns are common enough that they've been given their own named categories under that larger umbrella category of dark pattern. Roach Motel dark patterns, for instance, make it easy to get into some types of situation, but difficult to get out. So if joining a membership program is as easy as a couple of clicks, but leaving that program requires that you call in to talk to an actual human, and the line you call has a wait time of 30 minutes when they answer at all, that is a Roach Motel design system that is meant to get you in, but not let you out. Privacy zuckering dark patterns 
named after Facebook founder Mark Zuckerberg, are design decisions that trick you into sharing more private information publicly than you would actually prefer to share. A lot of social networks use this dark pattern because the more public information they have on their network, the better their algorithms work, and the more data they have to either utilize themselves or to sell to third parties. But other types of services do the same for various purposes, including political campaigns and the political parties that back them. This model that WinRed used for Trump's campaign, and which they're now offering to other candidates, is made up of several dark pattern tactics. First, they use something called confirm shaming, which is sometimes called a negative opt-out. If you've ever been to a website that presents a pop-up asking you to subscribe to their newsletter, and the two buttons available say something like, yes, I'm smart and make good decisions, sign me up, while the other says, no, I hate puppies, that is an example of confirm shaming. Basically, they try to gently or forcefully shame you into doing the thing that they want you to do, and they do that sometimes by making the opt-out button something that you don't want to click. Second, they used a bait-and-switch dark pattern because of the confusing and misleading language they apply and because of how they structure the checkboxes and donation page. You might intend to give a certain amount, but by doing the things it seems like you're meant to do to give that amount, to do the thing that you intend, you're instead tricked into giving more, tricked into doing something that you did not intend. Third, there's a dark pattern called forced continuity, which is sort of what Columbia Records did when they gave away a free CD, but then continued to charge club members for future shipments, often without giving them a clear or easy way to stop those charges, and in many cases without clear messaging that they were being charged more and would continue to be charged in the first place. And fourth, the classic trick question dark pattern uses confusing language to get people to click things, or in this case, not click things so that the user ends up with outcomes they didn't intend. Even reading the text in those bright yellow boxes carefully, you could walk away thinking they meant any number of things, and attaching that text to a pre-checked checkbox is a core part of the problem here. So those are dark patterns, and those I described represent only a handful of the many clever ways designers and developers and copywriters trick folks on the other end of their products and services into doing things that are good for them, the makers of these things and the businesses trying to earn money, but not necessarily good for their customers, users, and supporters. California's new ban only targets some of these dark pattern types. Under this ban, it is illegal to use confusing language. It's illegal to force users to, quote, click through or listen to reasons why they should not submit a request to opt out before confirming their request, end quote. And it's illegal to require users to wade through a bunch of text to figure out how to opt out of something. The ban is fairly tame in how it applies this law. Businesses that don't adhere to its tenets are sent a warning, after which they have 30 days to bring things into compliance. So there's a good chance that some entities, including political parties, will continue doing things as they do them today, and just keep assuring the government that they will bring things into compliance, making gestures at evolving their approaches, but mostly just running down the clock, and maybe paying a fine here and there when required. That said, this ban, paired with the increasingly stern and expansive scope of the California Consumer Privacy Act of 2018, the aforementioned regulation that was recently updated, might eventually lead to some changes in this space. Because although these rules only apply in California, it's often a lot more cumbersome to try to build something online that only works in some areas, but not others. And inevitably, even if you target things really effectively, you'll still accidentally hit folks in California as well, which would mean that you're running afoul of this law, and thus your expensive efforts to segregate messaging based on state was pointless. Thus, as this law expands, and as the government gets better at enforcing it, it's likely we'll see more cautious use of these types of tricks. And though some entities like WinRed, and a whole lot of politicians and entities that serve them from all parties, seem to be more concerned with outcomes, rather than how those outcomes are achieved, 
there is a chance that the punishments for violating these terms will eventually become significant enough that we see a lot less manipulative marketing and fundraising efforts, and a reduction in companies auto-signing people up to subscription programs that they don't actually want, but can't figure out how to leave. There's still a lot of work to be done in this space, though, as the Hall of Shame page on the darkpatterns.org website demonstrates. A lot of companies use these sorts of tricks, including many that you probably use on a regular basis and didn't realize were trying to manipulate you, perhaps successfully. We also still have quite a ways to go in the political sphere. Not long before the day I recorded this episode, new fundraising emails went out to Republican supporters, with that familiar yellow box, the pre-checked blue box inside it, and big, bold letters with periodic all-caps words saying, quote, We need to know we haven't lost you to the radical left. If you uncheck this box, we will have to tell Trump you're a defector and sided with the Dems. Check this box and we can win back the House and get Trump to run in 2024, end quote. And below all that, in smaller, non-bolded, non-all-caps lettering, it says, quote, Make this a monthly recurring donation. End quote. If you're enjoying Let's Know Things, consider becoming a supporter. I promise I won't try to use any dark patterns to convince you to do so. But if you are keen to do so, and decide to do so of your own free will, one of the simplest ways to support this show is to become a patron at patreon.com slash let's know things. Folks who contribute any amount each month receive an additional episode of the show each month, and a call to action and ad-free version of the show. Great big thanks to everybody who's already helping to support this podcast in some way, shape, or form, and thanks in advance if you're considering doing so in the future. The book that I'd like to recommend today is called The Code Breaker, Jennifer Doudna, Gene Editing, and The Future of the Human Race by Walter Isaacson. I am not a huge fan of biographies, so I don't read a whole lot of Walter Isaacson's work, because he has a penchant for writing great big in-depth biographies about people who make waves in history, Steve Jobs and Leonardo da Vinci and people like that. And I thought this book might be one of those types of books, but I picked it up anyway because I was curious about the subject, Jennifer Doudna, but also her work related to the research that led up to the new types of COVID vaccines that we have available that were developed so rapidly, but also her work in CRISPR beforehand. I was superficially aware that these two realms of inquiry were connected, but I didn't realize quite how connected and how the same cast of characters that were working so frantically to develop CRISPR-related tools essentially had to set their competition aside, at least temporarily, in order to pursue the tools that we needed to overcome a global pandemic. And this book does an excellent job of connecting those two periods, which go back decades, but extend up to the current moment in early 2021, and helping you better understand the people involved, but also how this aspect of biotechnology is very likely to affect pretty much every aspect of human life in the coming decades. Now, if any of that sounds interesting to you, consider picking up a copy of The Code Breaker by Walter Isaacson. You can find out more about me and my work at colin.io. You can find the show notes and transcript of this episode and every episode of the podcast at letsknowthings.com. You can find my other podcast, Brain Lenses, at brainlenses.com. And you can find my daily news summary-focused newsletter, One Sentence News, at onesentencenews.com. Feel free to reach out and say howdy on social media. I'm Colin Wright on Facebook and at Colin is my name on most of the other ones. Thank you so very much for listening. I'm Colin Wright, and I'll talk to you again next week. Thank you.